I'd like to invite Meda up to stage and uh, we can get started. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you for, to the organizers for having me. The problem we face right now is, is trying to increase food production, and you guys are working not so much on the production side, but the quality side. Um, I'm, I'm coming to this with my agronomist hat on. I was uh, a cropping systems agronomist before I sort of switched gears and moved into data standards, data management. Um, what we need to do really is to increase both the, the food quantity as well as food quality uh, to feed about 9 billion people by 2050. Well, how are we going to do this? This isn't going to happen through our uh, sort of business as usual means, clearly. Uh, what we believe with the big data platform is that if we can improve access to technology, if we can leverage some of the newer technologies in terms of uh, digital technologies, then we're going to be in, in much better shape and we'll be able to do this. Um, the key to this is getting the agricultural sector to be smarter and in many ways to make it digital, to, to leverage, not to make the agricultural sector digital so much, but to leverage digital technologies uh, to do better at what we're trying to enable in terms of quality and quantity of food production. So how are we going to do this? How, how do we inf ensure that uh, we make good use, smart and effective use of data? Uh, because at the, at, obviously at the bottom of digitization is data. Um, this is what the big data platform of the CGIR is all about, really. So what we want to do is to harness big data technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and put it to use uh, for agriculture, transform agriculture, just the same way as uh, biomedical field, uh, as the gen genetic and genomic fields have been transformed uh, by, by the application of these technologies. So the, the key goal here, I think for all of us, whether you're coming at this from a production end or from a quantity quality end, um, we want to turn data into insight. And the root of this, of course, is the data. So we have to be able to, um, to leverage that data well. Um, the big data platform is trying to do this by building, building the whole sort of palace on three pillars. Uh, the three pillars are called organize, convene, and inspire. And they pretty much tell you what those modules or pillars are about. Organize is about organizing data. And, and in this case, we're primarily focusing on CGIR. So we're working across all of the CGIR centers, uh, which is not easy, as Joe kind of alluded to. Um, and, and what we're doing is organizing for fair and open data, analytics, and capacity. So we're, we're trying to do a lot of different things through this one module. Um, you'll hear mostly about organize as I go forward in, in my presentation. I'll also talk a little bit about what I mean by fair data. Uh, the second module is called convene. And as the name implies, Convene is all about building the right kinds of partnerships. We recognize that at CGIR, we may not have, uh, you know, inherently the, 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 uh, our, the comparative advantage to be, to, be, uh, to be the technological people. I mean, you know, we don't have traditional ex expertise in, in machine learning, say, or artificial intelligence. Um, we don't have really traditional knowledge necessarily in some of the cutting edge other ICT technologies. Um, so we need to build those partnerships and that's what Convene is there for. Um, inspire is about sort of more of the blue sky thinking. How do we inspire with examples? How do we innovate? How can we have a small grants kind of program that allows us to, to use what we've done in the other two modules and show the value of those, those things? So that's kind of the big data platform in a nutshell. Now, I uh, mentioned FAIR. FAIR means making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. FAIR. Um, why are we talking about FAIR rather than open? Well, we've encountered issues where people have taken um, their summary data that they've used in a publication, say. They've, they have a PDF of this you know, summary table of data. They throw it into an open repository and they say, there, it's open. But what can you actually do with that data? The whole point of, of what we're trying to do when we, when we talk about tackling challenges of the sort that we face, we need to be able to aggregate data very often across fields, across, certainly across, across you know, different kinds of uh, different data sets within even the same project, but even beyond the project, 
and increasingly across fields, across disciplines. Well, how are we going to do that if people are throwing up PDFs of data sets? It's, 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 you can imagine that it's not, it's not that easy to leverage these technologies. So we're talking about FAIR for that reason. Um, we're also talking about FAIR because there are a number of reasons to, to make your data FAIR. For one thing, it avoids duplication of effort. I mean, if you can find data that, that, that's in the public domain, um, you can tell whether the, the kind of work that you're pursuing has already been done or some part of it has already been done. Um, for instance, in agronomy, you know, we, we had any number of trials on planting date. Well, do we really need, did we really need to have all those many trials on the one thing? Not necessarily. So, so the question is, what, what, how can you save shrinking uh, research dollars? That's, that's one of the advantages of, of making data fair. Facilitating your core mission, turning that data into insight implies, as I just said, uh, being able to aggregate data, being able to reuse data that's, and innovate using other data sets. Um, so that's one of the, the reasons to make data fair. Um, there's an increasing sort of reputational risk to not making data open and, and reusable. So, so that's very much a part of this as well, increasing your research visibility, increasing, you know, improving your, your own sort of reputational footprint, if you will. The biggest reason, in my view, or one of the biggest reasons, is, of course, um, providing the potential for uh, uh, data science to, to, to do its magic, essentially. I mean, data science is based on data. Um, the technologies that we would like to use to transform agriculture, machine learning, AI, all based on data, well, that data needs to be conforming to standards that make it reusable and, and aggregatable, essentially. Um, the other sort of piece of this making data fair is related also, again, to reputational risk. And that comes with uh, the, the fact that an increasing number of funders uh, and countries and organizations are, are requiring that data be made not just open, but actually reusable, because I think uh, people are beginning to realize that, that these, you know, PDFs and being able to find sort of roughly what somebody did is not enough. You need to actually be able to leverage that work. Um, so, so that's another key thing. And yet another very important reason is democratizing access, uh, which with increased digitization also comes risk. And we, we at the Big Data Platform are not unaware of that, obviously. We, we are very much aware of that. Uh, we're trying to do what we can to, to recognize that people um, you know, need access both from, from the using the data end, but also being able to claim some ownership over the products that they, that they um, create and be able to, to make that stuff available uh, in their own names. So there's many reasons to make data fair. And, um, you know, part of, part of making that, that uh, your, your work fair, your data particularly fair, not so much the publications, um, is, is recognizing what the value is of doing this. So I've already talked a little bit about some of the value, but let me dig in a little bit to one example that, that we feel um, uh, that we're pursuing in the, in the, through the big data platform. So this is a tool called Guardian. Um, and Guardian stands for a Global Agricultural Re uh, Research Data Innovation and Acceleration Network. So Innovation Acceleration Network tells you what we're trying to do. Um, we're trying to get data to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and by doing that, uh, accelerate the, 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 the value of that, of that data, really. Right, so um, I've taken a few screenshots because I didn't really want to um, trust myself doing a live demo, you know, when any number of things could go wrong. So, um, but, but I welcome you to, uh, invite you and welcome you to, to, to play with it yourself after this. The URL's up there. Uh, and what Guardian is, is basically an aggregator of data. So right now, it's, it's just looking across CGIR's 30-odd data and publications repositories. So, um, you know, because we have 15 centers, every center typically has a data repository and a publications repository. The two things don't talk to each other. Um, so it's, it's important to get those things talking to each other, and I don't know what's going on there now. OK, <laughs> thanks. Right, so um, uh, that, that's one piece of it, is just linking publications with data and also being able to find data across 
wherever it sits really, across these 15 centers, and very shortly um, across you know, any repository that's out in the public domain. So I can do a search for something like this, uh, nutrition in women. I'm interested in some gender aspect of the kind of work that you do. And what Guardian returns to me is a number of different uh, uh, data sets and publications. So right now I'm seeing just under about 500 publications that, that, that are returned across CGIAR um, and 59 data sets. And I should say that we are now able to, to show you in, the, the, as a first use case, um, DFID repositories that show up here. So they, the, uh, I think it's uh, uk.gov uh, repository that's, that's showing up along with, alongside CGIR results. And increasingly will be showing up results from other repositories as well. And will be allowing researchers like you, if you don't have a repository in your own institution, to upload your own data to this and claim your ownership with it. So that's coming very shortly. But what you also see, apart from the orange uh, uh, tab there that refers primarily to CGIR and just a little bit of stuff coming in from DFID already, but you also see results uh, coming in from PubMed Central, which is, um, uh, I won't go into what that is, but, but it's a large repository of, of publications primarily focused on biomed, uh, um, genomics and genetics related to this search. Um, and the European nucleotide archive accessions, as you might you know, guess, are, are yeah, I'm not seeing anything there. But I do see a lot of publications coming in from uh, gov.uk. So you can see, see the results there. Um, and when I look at what I see on the page, I see, I, I've clicked on the publications tab here, and I see a list of publications coming in from a number of different CGIR centers. Before Guardian, this was not possible to see. So we've actually tried to enable that sort of findability of resources across CGIR um, to show you what the value of that is. If I click on um, the, the data sets tab, what I see is a number of data sets, for, again, from across CGIR. But if you, if you look at the top one there, that's coming from the DFID. Uh, that's a DFID data set, DFID funded one. So just to just sort of show you that when your data is well described, when it's findable, um, it can play in the same domain as a number of other data sets. So you're able to sort of contextualize what you do um, with a number of other types of data. If I dive into any one of these data sets, what does that look like? So I have a, a series of screenshots here that take you through a single data set in Guardian just to show you what pieces of that look like. Um, so as you as, as researchers can think about what, what that takes. Um, the first thing you see on the, on the left-hand panel there is access rights. It's really important for findability, uh, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability to tell the user what rights they have in terms of being able to use your data. It's very important. So this, for instance, is a CC by license. CC stands for Creative Commons. It's a very, very common and well-regarded um, standard that, that I encourage you to use, and I'll come back to this at the end of my presentation. Uh, but remember that, Creative Commons licenses, easy to use, machine readable, and they run the gamut from being totally open, unrestricted access, all the way through to, to quite restrictive in, in what you're, so, so it's your right to put a license on that, uh, that you believe is needed for your work. Um, but it's important to have a license. It's important to, to tell users what rights they have in, in, in being able to use that. You have, some, um, you have some metadata there. So you have the title of the data set. You have where it's available from. You have the authors, which are, are blue, which are also linked, because increasingly we're trying to use you know, linkages and linked data across this. Um, so, so we've put some of the, the metadata there. Now, what Guardian does is it only uses the metadata. It's only a metadata harvester, really. In order to get the resource, you actually have to click on the link there, because it's the, the, the resource itself sits in the repository that it was deposited in, which means that your institution or you, as a researcher, have full control on that. We're not doing anything with, with your stuff. I want to you know, emphasize that. Um, of course, if you upload your stuff to Guardian, then you're, you know, then you're actually uploading the data set itself to Guardian. That's not implemented yet, but it will be soon this year. Um, going down 
to the next screen in that same data set, you see a little bit of summary. So this means that this person, these people, these authors, have actually added some rich metadata to this. They've added, you know, what this is about. What is this data set about? Um, there's keywords at the bottom that have also been added by the researcher, which helps in the findability and accessibility of this thing. Um, but there's also some algorithms that run behind the scenes in Guardian that actually do some data mining and text mining to enrich the metadata that you as a researcher provide. If there's a summary, then that, of, uh, that helps those algorithms work better. Um, on, on the screen below the geographic sort of coverage of this, you see something called fair compliance and you see a little squiggly little diagram there. Um, what that is, is a set of algorithms scripts that run behind every resource to sort of calculate how fair is this thing. And it gives a score for the F, the A, the I, and the R, which allows you to sort of say, okay, well, I can make my, you know, I can tinker with it. I can make this a little bit more interoperable, perhaps. I can make this a little bit more um, reusable, perhaps, overall, by, by, by working through these. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But just know that all of this exists in Guardian. If you click on any one of those keywords, what it's going to do is, is basically filter within Guardian's data pool um, on that particular keyword. So it's a way of sort of honing in on, on another search in Guardian. This is the, the bottom of that data set. So what you see here is a link to the data set files. In the new version, it's actually been enabled. So for the, for the, the resources, the data sets with the least restrictive licenses, those CC BY licenses, the CC zero licenses. CC again is Creative Commons. What you'll be able to do is click on that, those links there and go directly to the data. And this is a first step towards ena enabling batch downloads of data for the data science part of the, the stuff that we're trying to do for the algorithms to work with. Um, at the very bottom, you see relevant publications. Now this again is tying uh, contextually linked Data, uh, data assets, if you will, together. So from this data set, um, I don't know which publication actually or publications were published using this data set because nowhere in CGIR's repositories are those two things linked. But the algorithms that, that work in Guardian actually try to do some sort of contextualizing and saying, okay, we think, it's like the recommender systems that you might be used to when you shop online, for instance, or you, you, know, you watch movies online. It's telling you that we think that these things are basically related to this data set. And that helps you contextualize a little bit what you're looking at in terms of data. So that's, that's what this effort is about. Right, now I've talked a lot about findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. And you're sitting there scratching your head saying, all right, enough already, just tell me how to do this, right? So, so this is, how do I make my data fair? Okay, so for a data set to be fair, let's tackle the findability aspect first. For data to be findable, you need what's known as a persistent identifier. That means that your, your uh, publication or your data set needs to have a DOI, a digital object identifier, this is persistent, or a handle, which is also persistent. If you just have a URL, that can change any time. So that, that's not a good idea. So using a DOI, using a handle. Those are the, the key messages here. Rich metadata. Who here knows what metadata is? Raise your hands. People are shy or a few of you do, some of you don't. So let me go through it. Um, I'm gonna pull up a data set here um, that, that you can Hopefully, well, you can't see much, but, but I'll, I'll read off what's on the, on the um, left-hand side there. What this is telling you is uh, in this data set, the second column in is titled variable, and it basically lists all of the variables in this data set and tells you what they refer to. So it tells you that one variable is, um, describes, or a number of different variable, variables describe site the site of the experiment, and that's country name, the project site name, there's a farmer code, there's treatment names, et cetera, that fall within this. Basically what this is trying to do is to, to um, describe the, 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 the actual what was done here and by whom. So you see contributor, for instance, a contributor is the author of that data set. Who's done this? Where was it done? 
How was it done? When was it done? So the who, what, when, why, where, that's the metadata, right? Without that, nobody else can really interpret the data. A, person, a human being can't interpret it, and certainly a machine can't. So as we talk about machine learning and AI, we need to be able to have uh, you know, very rich and good and accurate metadata. Um, this next slide is, is actually what I see on my, on my screen. It doesn't change for me, so I have to look at that one. But this is just um, diving more into that data and actually really clearly identifying all the variables that were collected uh, in, in, in this experiment. I'm sorry you can't see it, but, but the idea here is that it, it tends to be a fair bit of work when you first start, as you might imagine looking at this kind of uh, uh, spreadsheet. This is a spreadsheet that has four tabs, actually. The first one is general metadata for the, for the data set, and this tab is sort of the variable metadata, so it actually tells you exactly what each variable is, and you need both, um, really. And then there are tabs for the on-station data and on-farm collection data. So it's important to have the who, what, when, why, where. Uh, it's important to have good documentation, summaries, abstracts, things like that. Um, for data or, or data asset, publication or a data set, to be accessible, it needs to have a, a license. And ideally, that would be as unrestrictive a license as possible, which makes the, the more unrestrictive the license, the more open the, the, the resources. Um, you need to have access to both the metadata and the physical asset. So, so that makes something more accessible. So if you want to get from sort of one to five on, the, on, the, on that fair scale, on the, a, the scale for A, you would need to do more of this, more metadata, more, more um, uh, a richer summary, richer abstract, et cetera. Um, for interoperability, Joe mentioned interoperability. What does that mean? Well, all that means is that you're speaking the same language across resources. I can give you an example from my domain, agronomy. Um, you might want to call something tillage, to till the land. Tilling the land is tillage. Um, I might call it plowing. Somebody else might call it hoeing or whatever it is. Well, how do we know and how does a machine know that we're all talking about the same thing? So this is where the common language comes in. And the common language that we're talking about um, is implemented through certain standards. And one of those standards is metadata standards. There are standard schemas uh, for metadata. And, and the other piece of this is a little harder to grasp, is controlled vocabularies, which are like glossaries, that say, OK, this is the terminology uh, that is accepted, tillage. And it means all of these different things. So it's basically taking a bunch of words and saying these are all synonyms and here's a word that you can use to describe all of those things. That's the common language I'm talking about. Um, ontologies are similar, but the difference with, between ontologies and controlled vocabularies are that ontologies are hierarchical. So it will tell you that something like a concept, like tillage, which I mentioned earlier, is a, um, a part of a larger concept which might be land preparation. So it's, it's sort of moving up in a hierarchy and showing you that. Now, I have a few screenshots to kind of dive in a little bit more. Um, since this is supposed to be a learning lab, I thought I would throw some learning out there, hopefully, at you. Um, right, so the, the last principle there, the R, the reusability, is, as you might expect, a composite of the other three. So uh, if something is not findable, if it's not accessible, if it's not interoperable, it's really not going to be reusable needs to be all three of the other things to be reusable. So that's what we're focusing on. And there's more information on this available from the Guardian website that I just showed you. If you do a search in Guardian and you go to um, the, the services or the analytics part of this, you'll see, you'll see more uh, guidance on that and URLs over there. I'm assuming these slides are gonna be shared. So I've shown you a little bit how you can get to it there. Uh, when you do a search, you see analytics on the second search page. Uh, you can go there and look at this. Um, or when you see uh, you know, the, that, that, that fair compliance little squiggle circles, the FAIR circles, below that you'll always see view metrics. And if you click on the view metrics, uh, then you'll see something that looks like this. this. I've just put this up for the findability aspect. It really goes blow by blow and tells you you know, how you get the points, the 0.25 by 0.25 points to make something 
more findable, more accessible, more interoperable, and more reusable. Okay, I'm not gonna dive into this in any more detail for this purpose, uh, but, but you should feel free to, to look at that. Right, diving more into interoperability. We are used to uh, the, the World Wide Web, and in order to surf pages to you when you do a search, basically uh, there's a lot of interoperability there, but that's what's known as syntactic interoperability. Those are machines talking to each other just uh, you know, at, a, at a sort of a program level to, to serve you pages, say. But if you want actually to ascribe meaning, if you want to really use machine learning and artificial intelligence, the machine needs to understand what you mean by a word. When you say the word, when you type in the word plant, are you referring to a green plant? Or are you referring to a, to a you know, to a, an industrial plant? The machine doesn't know that, it's just the word plant. So by using ontologies, which are hierarchical, and they're these large, very um, consistent, concept schemes, you, the machine can understand what, what exactly is meant by that. Joe, I hope this is making sense to you. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, there will be a pop quiz at the end of this. Um, right, so let's have a look at one of these ontologies. So here's one that I am not sure folks at the back of the room are entirely able to see, but, but what it's what it's showing is sort of, this is a kind of a geopolitical ontology or part of one, if you will. So if you look at the, uh, one of the bubbles there is Stratford upon Avon, which I believe is where Shakespeare was born. Um, so that's a little village in the UK, but what, what, it has an arrow up that shows that the parent of this little village, of this, of, of this village is really, I think it's a county, if I'm not mistaken, Warwickshire. Um, I don't know if that's the right terminology or not, but I believe they call them counties in England. So it's the parent of this, this thing is, is a county, and the parent of that is England, which shows up at a higher level, and the parent of that shows up as the United Kingdom. And until very recently, the United Kingdom belonged to Europe, which unfortunately seems not to be happening, or, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, so, so this is a geopolitical ontology. It's a hierarchical structure that kind of, if you enter anywhere in this, you have the, the arrows that tell you, you know, that, that, that tell you what else is linked to this. So you can infer certain things from, from an ontology. Um, we have a lot of crop ontologies. So for the breeders and the agronomists, we have an agronomy ontology, we have crop ontologies that CGIR maintains. They're all out there in the open, anybody can use those. Um, and, and they look like that, which again, you can see some sort of hierarchy there, which show, tells you that, for instance, um, this is for rice, I'm, I'm showing you a rice ontology, and you can see uh, uh, abiotic stress as one of the concepts within that ontology. And under abiotic stress are a number of other sort of uh, children, if you will, alkali injury, cold tolerance, drought injury, et cetera. And if you open any one of these, you see uh, more, more details on that. So just know that, that an ontology basically allows you to, and allows the machine to infer things. Um, what does this look like? Well, actually, let me, let me I, ha I have the what does this look like in a little bit. But, but what, the, 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 what I also want to show you is the, the um, interoperability piece. If you cannot use ontologies, at the very least, I encourage you to use controlled vocabularies. And one of these is commonly used is Agrivoc. So when you do a search in Agrivoc, I've done the search there for nutrition. What you see is, is sort of a, a list of synonyms um, and, and, and the word nutrition sort of in different languages so that this becomes a multilingual kind of resource that allows you to, to connect the, the same concept in different languages, which is quite useful. Um, there's also another um, controlled vocabulary that might be of use to you as nutritionists, um, and this is the medical subject headings. So medical subject headings actually has that, the concepts, many of the concepts that many of you might be interested in. I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and we can discuss this more tomorrow uh, because I believe there's a sort of a one-on-one -on -one kind of session tomorrow in the morning. 
Right, so what does that allow you to do? The use of controlled vocabularies and, and ontologies allows you to participate in this linked open data domain. Um, it looks like a mess right now, but if you just focus on the magenta or the dark pink area there, that's linked open data in the life sciences. And each of those circles is a database in the life sciences. And what that means is that each database can be connected to many others because the concepts are common across these because people are using standards like ontologies. So what this allows you to do is connect across domains. So what does this look like for, for us? Um, suppose you have an experimental site in Baco. Well, Baco, where is it? Um, this is, I'm, I'm leveraging the, the geopolitical ontology here. I'm saying, okay, the administrative division above Baco is also called Baco here. Um, and the, the division above it, the, the administrative division above it is called Oromia. And this is part of the country of Ethiopia. So I just showed you the, the ontology for, for the UK. This is kind of allowing me to link, when I, when I use an ontology and I say that I'm doing this experiment, my experimental site is in the admin, admin division two called BACO, it already understands, the machine will understand that this is in Ethiopia because it's tied to an ontology. That's the power of it. Right, now maybe I have a project, the Imana project. Maybe it's, it's operational in this, um, in BACO, the, the admin division two. The research ed entity that's administering it, so it's administered by uh, the LSHTM. So I'm building sort of a knowledge graph here using concepts from different ontologies. And the key thing here about an ontology is that every piece of it is what's known as a triple. There are three things here, a subject, an object, and a predicate. The predicate or, or is kind of the verb. So you have the project Imana administered by, that's the verb or the predicate, the research entity LSHTM. So there's a subject, which is the research entity, the object, which is the project Imana, and the, and the predicate there. Every piece of this, we're building a knowledge graph using these triples, right? So now I, I, I see that the Project Imana might have a, a process, a planting process, and what's being planted is a crop rice. That's the participant of this planting process. And that process is occurring in, say, four plots or 100 plots or 500 plots or whatever it is, right? Um, Maybe the Project Imana also has another process in that same experiment uh, of managing nutrients. And one of the pieces of that nutrient management process is iron fortification. Perhaps I'm in some of my plots here, two of my four plots, I'm, I'm adding iron, and in two of the other plots, or the, the other two plots, I'm not adding iron. So that's, what I'm trying to do here is describe my experiment in terms of an ontology, and I'm not being strict an ontologist might cringe, but I want to get my point across to you as to what this enables us to do. Right, now you, you might have many such processes. We're, let's, let's just focus on the planting and nutrient management for this. Um, you might also have other things happening in that uh, admin division of BACO. You might have some sort of survey that's being done by uh, the Ethiopia Stats Statistical, uh, the Central Statistical Division, for instance. Um, and that survey is assessing nutritional outcomes, perhaps. And what you might, one of the, the measurements of that might be some sort of clinical workup, maybe the blood iron of women or, or, or uh, you know, uh, women over the age of 16 or something like that. Um, all of that now is being, you can find all of this easily if ontologies are used because it's all connected through this kind of knowledge graph. So I hope that, I know that this concept is not very, very easy, but I hope you're starting to see how this might be possible. Now you might have other data, like you saw in that linked open data graph. You have saw all of those circles in the magenta. Um, you might have other databases, for example, the World Health Organization database that has some interesting data that you might want to use. If that data is also using the same concept schemes, then you'll be, you know, you'll be able to aggregate that data much easier. You'll be able to find it and aggregate it much easier because that all becomes linked data because you're using the same standards. So here's where the interoperability is absolutely key. The, the kind of power that you get from using these standards is phenomenal. Right, so just a little bit about how we leverage this. I'm jumping back to Guardian now. 
Um, to demonstrate, this is a large data set that, that's actually been worked on by uh, the Community for Spatial Information at CGIR and uh, through a project led by Jawu Ku at IFPRI. Um, what this is showing you is that I can go into georeference data. So if your data is well described, if it's using ontologies ideally, if it's, if it's using uh, uh, good geolocation coordinates, I'm looking now at, at the, the rain-fed yield of rice globally, and I've honed in on India. What I can do is use this visualization. I can take a pin and I can drop it on any point in that map, and I can, uh, what pops up at me is the, the outline of the country that I've dropped the pin on, of course, but also some summary statistics from this data set. So it tells me uh, you know, what the, the maximum, the minimum yield is, and what the mean yield is for India. I can also hone in on any one area, and I can use the polygon feature of this to draw a sort of a polygon on the, on the map, and it'll pop up a summary statistic for that. What we're trying to enable is to, to use the data pool of Guardian as it becomes more semantically interoperable, as it uses these standards, to be able to do these kinds of visualizations. So, you know, show me, uh, I don't know, oh, I, in, in nutrition, perhaps, uh, you know, what is the, uh, the, the stunting rate of children under 12 or girl children under 12 for India versus for Ethiopia or something like that. You, you can do these kinds of queries. The technology exists. The problem is that, the, the, you know, our culture needs to change to get us to be using these sorts of standards. And then the visualizations follow from, from, from having the data well described. So what you can do with this stuff say, can, can save you a heck of a lot of time. Um, this is another example from Guardian. This is a, a, a subcontract that we have with the University of California at Davis. Uh, what they did was to try and answer a very big question, broad question. Uh, we want to understand the variation in crop response to fertilizer across sub-Saharan Africa. So they went to Guardian, and they found about 120-some data sets in Guardian that they could conceivably sort of suck data from to, to do this kind of uh, you know, analysis. And they did the analysis. As you might expect, there's tremendous variability. But you start seeing, when you start plotting that data, you start seeing some patterns uh, where the, 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 the graph on the, on the right-hand side of the, of the slide there uh, shows you the crop response to 50 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen. And it's just thrown on the map, really quick and dirty. And you start seeing that the crop response is actually responses higher towards the, the um, eastern side of, of that map. Now, we don't know why. We, we have to dive into those data sets. We have to understand that more clearly. But just having that sort of power to, to, to answer this kind of question, leveraging the kind of data that we have at hand, is pretty powerful. And you can do the same thing for the kinds of questions you're interested in if they're, you know, well described. Right, so this is pretty much the end of um, my talk. Uh, what is the take home message, you might be wondering. This woman has stood up there and thrown a bunch of stuff at us, which is, you know, some of it I kind of got, some of it went over my head. What, just tell us what we, we need to know out of this, right? So the take home messages. I encourage you, first of all, to use digital tools to collect data when possible. There's a lot less scope for, um, for, for you know, error. There's a lot more standardization and, and consistency that goes into that. So, so that's sort of one take home message. The second one is add metadata, use a standard schema when possible. There are a number of them out there. I can't dive into all of them, but, but you know, hopefully there are data managers that you can, you can talk to, if not, email me, I'm happy to quickly answer a question or put you in touch with somebody at CGIR who'll be able to answer your question. I'm happy to do that. So remember that, that you must have for any data the who, the when, the what, the how, the where, at minimum, right? Um, that's, that's really critical because without that, nobody else can understand the data and, and certainly no machine can. Um, Georeferencing data collection is absolutely critical because location is everything. You, you, you will not be able to, to really do much with the data unless you understand where it's from and what the, the local context is for that data. Now, of course, 
as we do that, we also have to keep in mind privacy and ethics considerations. So those two things kind of are constantly tussling with each other, um, and it's, it's difficult to know what to do. But what we do is we encourage people to blur data subject locations for surveys, for instance, um, particularly when you're working in, with at-risk populations or at-risk questions. Um, so this is really important to blur up. The, the kind of power that, that we have these days, you can combine you know, different publicly available data plus you know, some data set that I might have collected and be able to hone in on a particular household. That's compromising somebody's privacy. So it's not something that we want to do, and that's why we encourage doing this. What does this mean? Well, what it means is this is a sort of a map that shows you a point, which may be a location, a household in Delhi. Well, instead of honing in on that particular household, you can blur that up, and there are tools in the public domain that help you do this. Uh, you can blur it up to a larger area. And that you can define what that needs to be based on the population density of that location that you're working on. So just keep that in mind. Right. The richness of the, the, the um, descriptions that you have with your publication or data set matter. Add a summary. Add an abstract. Add, you know, keywords. So, so make your descriptions and annotations as rich as possible. I talked about ontologies. Annotate your resource with ontology terms. One of the tools that we will be unveiling through Guardian, and that'll, that hopefully will be a standalone tool, tool as well, will allow you to annotate data sets very easily without knowing anything about ontologies, really. That's the idea. That's what we're aiming for. So, so within a few months, we hope to have that. We have it in, in very early prototype right now, and it's not particularly user-friendly, but we're working towards a tool that will allow you to do this. There's also another tool that will allow you to very easily add metadata. So that's coming too. The two things are connected. Uh, that you can use to annotate your data sets and then upload them to a repository of your choice. Okay? So we're not trying to push you to Guardian. We're not trying to push you anywhere. We just want people to be able to leverage what, what's already there in terms of technologies. Um, don't just annotate your data set or publication, oh, well, the publication is at the publication level with ontology terms, but for data, you will want to also describe the data variables themselves with ontology terms to the extent possible, because that enables you to have the sort of linked data that, that I, I just, I showed you earlier. Um, the licensing. I talked about the licenses. Creative Commons is the, co the, the, the licensing uh, service that's very easy to use, completely open, completely free to use. Um, as far as possible, add an unrestricted license. Um, and and, and it, it, Creative Commons it really is the best one here because these licenses are all machine readable. So that helps, you know, you don't have to, uh, the machine can understand what the, what the rights are, access rights are for that license or for that resource. And lastly, make sure you're uploading your data to a public repository that allows itself to be searched and harvested. So it should respond to APIs. It should be, you know, the metadata schemas in use by the repository itself should be standards, et cetera. So those are sort of the take-home messages. What can I do to, to make my data more fair? Well, the, here's what you can do to, to make it more fair. Right. I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to take some questions now, but you can also email me. My email is there. Um, you can also come to tomorrow morning's uh, open data drop-in breakfast session. That's in the Evolve room tomorrow. So I'll be there, and you can come, at, come up to me. You can ask questions. We can go through things in small groups or one-on-one -on -one or whatever, and there's plenty of things I don't know, but if I don't know, chances are good that I know somebody who does know. So I'll put you in touch with that person. Um, so that's in the Evolve Room tomorrow, I think, at an ungodly hour, 7.45. Yes. So be there if you have questions. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Thanks, Meda. Yeah, we've got about 10, 15 minutes if anyone's got any questions. Great. So. Hi, good morning. Thank you for this very nice presentation. Uh, I was wondering, in terms of um, copyrights, in case you have published something and you would like to put it in this database, how, how does this work in terms of 
um, copyrights that you would have with the publisher of an article. So you have it in a journal, you've published something in the journal already. Um, usually there's a period over which that copyright uh, will, will, will uh, apply and after that you should be able to take your, your publication and, and put it up in Guardian. What we're encouraging people to do, and I should have put that in my list of to-dos, is to make your publication open from the start. Now, often that involves, unfortunately, the publishers gouge you. I mean, they'll, 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 they'll want you to pay up front. How many ever, you know, the average cost, I believe, at least a couple of years ago was $1,500 per publication to make it open. That's average. And then, of course, on the other end, they get you because if you want to subscribe to that journal, you have to pay again. Um, but there are ways of trying to negotiate that. Uh, particularly for developing countries, the publishers are much more willing to, to uh, you know, to, to negotiate or to give you a break. Um, there are also, if, I don't know, you know, who funds your research, but the funders often have clauses that allow, uh, uh, that allow you to negotiate or to give you a, a special deal. I know for the Gates Foundation, they have a, a separate pool, or they had a separate pool until recently anyway, that I know of, um, that allowed you to draw on, a, so if you received a grant from the Gates Foundation, in other words, and you wanted to publish in a closed journal, you could use that pool of money to fund your publication. So you wouldn't be taking away money from the research. But really, we should all be publishing to the extent possible in open journals to begin with. If you're not, then the copyright will expire and that's when you can, you can get it in. I think you may also be able to get a pre-publication uh, manuscript up into Guardian. So, you know, the proof that you send to the publishers. Some publishers have clauses against that and others don't. So you have to check as to whether you're in compliance or not. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I, uh, I am very new uh, to this kind of data sets. But um, many research projects actually um, uh, demand, eh? uh, or at least make researchers promise that they will upload data and share data. But I wonder if um, they have taken into account the idea of property, uh, uh, intellectual uh, property rights. IP, because, yeah. yeah, yeah, intellectual property. Because sometimes you upload data and yeah. you find somebody has gone before you or before your group to publish this data. Right, and, and, your and data. so what, what we have at CGIR, uh, we have an open access and open data policy. Yeah. And that gives the researcher some time to publish, you know, using that data. What we often find is, you know, you've collected, the, and I've been on both sides of the coin here. I mean, I, I'm a researcher myself, so I know the sort of, oh my God, you know, I have to put this data up, and I, there's something I might have missed in the data, and somebody else is going to take it and publish that, that fantastic paper. But think about it. You know, why are you collecting that data? What is our business? What are we here for? I mean, this is, you know, yes, you've published your paper, you've collected the data, now, is it going to sit on your la laptop and die on your laptop with you? Or, or is it going to be out there for somebody else to innovate with it? Now, you could also put uh, your, your uh, you know, in the access rights, you could add something that tells people that you want to be contacted for, you know, with, with, given any work that, that happens with it, with this particular data set. But unless we share and unless we're willing to sort of assume that people are in general, in general, fair and just and good, um, we're not going to get anywhere. I mean, we're just going to be sitting where we are. So it's a choice. It's really a personal choice. And you have that choice. If, you, if, you're, if you're afraid to, to make data uh, you know, open, then don't make it open. But recognize that that's a huge lost opportunity, or it could be a huge, lo huge lost opportunity. And I think there are ways of, of getting around that trust issue. Um, there are ways of, of putting in the, the access rights uh, that, that say that you want to be contacted, for instance. Um, and when you look at other domains, again, I'll, I'll go back to the biomedical domain because I did a lot of bioinformatics work before I came to CGIR. Um, and so I know that, that world well. And over the last 30 years, human medicine has been quite drastically transformed. 
And I think really that's been powered by data and publications both, but primarily data being made open and available. And really the sky hasn't fallen down. You know, the NIH and NSF in the US mandated that data must be made open. Uh, they withheld 20% of funds from grantees until they saw good, um, you know, good uh, alignment with their open data policies. And people did it because they were kicked essentially to do it initially, but now it's become the culture of those communities to do that because they've recognized the power of making the data open. And certainly, I, I don't think it would have continued if there had been a lot of instances of people getting scooped. So I think we have to assume the best. We have to put in place the safeguards with, that we can with the access rights, usage rights, um, and, and you know, how I want to be cited, and, and, and go for it. The other thing I didn't mention also is, is when you make your data fair, when you make it in, you know, reusable, when people get to reuse your data, your citations go up, in fact. There have been studies to show that. So there is a reward for making that open. Increasingly, funders are incentivizing this. Institutions are incentivizing it as well, and, and ho I hope we'll continue to do that. So there, I think that the world is changing, and, and we can either go with it or you know, remain sort of locked into a, a different way of thinking. And I hope that most of us will choose to, to trust and, and go, go forward with it. My, uh, my, my I think uh, there was a question there and then another one here. I had and a second yes. question, actually. Something about qualitative data. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm losing track of who's talking. Something about qualitative data, because it is also very important, especially yes. large disciplinary teams. Qualitative data, yes. Um, so unstructured data, qualitative data, uh, focus groups, things like that. Um, you know, that sort of data has already been being mined. Uh, so when you look at uh, transcripts of phones, for instance, cell phone conversations, you know, that stuff is being mined. I mean, chats and and things like that are already being mined. And unfortunately, it's not something that I'm thrilled about, but it happens. And certainly the technologies exist to be able to do that. What doesn't exist is a way to sort of, you know, I talked about ontologies. Well, that's harder to deal with um, in describing qualitative data. I don't have an answer quite yet for that. Uh, we're trying to figure out how we might, you know, get past those, those bottlenecks. But the data itself can be mined through text mining techniques, for instance. Natural language processing, text mining, that can work on unstructured data more easily. I think you had a question? Yeah. Yes, so actually with respect to ontologies, um, can you just explain what that looks like in practice? Like, is it a tab on your Excel sheet that says like, Stratford-upon-Avon is part of this county, which is part of England, which no. is not part of Europe? <laughs> no, no, it's not. That's a very good question. Um, what you would do is simply each, so what I, what I omitted to mention is that um, every concept in an ontology has a, a, a unique resource identifier or URI. And so when you put that URI into, so if I have country, uh, you know, Kenya, I put the URI for, for the country. And the, the instance of that is Kenya. And so the, the, the machine understands now, based on the URI, what geopolitical ontology to look at and what that term that's associated with that uh, tag, country, actually means. So that's how you do it. You're, you're basically doing a, a, a search for you know, country and taking that URI and plunking that in. Thank you. Yeah? I can talk more about that tomorrow. We can dive in if you, or later after mm -hmm. this. Thank you. Sure. Question. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, thank you Hi. for the uh, nice talk. Uh, home from uh, Inri, uh, based in Vietnam. I think that the, the open access issue is less uh, problematic for researcher as us because it's uh, our data. We have the funding, and you need to make it open. In, in most of the case, if the donor asks us to do, or now CGI asks to do. We had some difficulty in uh, making data from yes. our partners open. Yes. For example, you know, we work with mi different ministries and they have the data yes. and we work with them, we publish with them. But when it comes to the question of open access, that it's actually become difficult. Uh, so, so, so what is our experience in that and you know, at CG at the moment, do you have any policy to promote that? And are we ready to pay on so partners right. Uh, right. To, to, to get it open? Right. Thank you. So, so what we also encourage people to do is um, at the start of a project, have very clear contracts 
and contractual language that make it clear to partners what their obligations are. Now we know, I've, I've worked in Nepal for many years, I know that it doesn't matter what people sign, they're still, you know, it's, it's often difficult to actually follow through on that. Um, you can only, you know, do as much as you can. So, so by putting in the contract, by trying to encourage uh, this democratization, you know, are, are the part, is the partner, um, you know, if you came to me, for instance, and I was working in India or Nepal, and you asked me to make something open, and I was reluctant, what is, what is the reason for my reluctance? Is it, is it, do I believe that it's because you're going to get credit from what I've done? Or is it something else? What is the cause of that? I think it behooves us to understand where that concern is coming from. And, and oftentimes, there may be legitimate concerns. So understanding that, I think, is a first step. The contractual stuff is kind of like the stick, you know? And you don't always want to lead with the stick. You want to try and lead with some in incentives. Uh, this is partly why we're trying to encourage uh, or, or why we're trying to build the upload functionality in Guardian to make, to, to provide people free of charge a tool that makes it easy for them to upload their data in a very well described way with their names on it so, and their institution on it so they get the full credit for what they've done. They may say done in collaboration with IFPRI or SIAT or CIMIT or whatever it is, but it's them. I mean, you know, they're, they're getting the credit for it and they understand what that means. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more uh, sort of sensitization and, and, and capacity building in the countries we work in as well on this. You know, trying to get people to understand what they could do uh, with data, trying to build the use cases for that. And one of the things we want to do is um, have a bunch of data products in Guardian through the projects like the University of California Davis project so that people can see what, you know, wow, this is a cool data set. I can do stuff with this. And I can put my data up here and it'll, it'll you know, play nice with this data too. So I think there's, in, you know, incentives that, that we need to, to build. This is something fairly new even for, you know, the, the, the global north. I mean, it's, it's not that established and it's not accepted even in, in, within CGIR, let's be frank about it. Um, and so, you know, trying to then also work across um, different cultures and different, you know, in, in emerging economies with these ideas can be threatening and I can see how that is. I think there are ways to get around it. I do think it'll take time, but we're getting there and I think people are much more used now to, to seeing data in their daily lives as, you know, we use smartphones all the time. We know what the power of data is. So I think it takes some convincing, it takes some cajoling, it takes a couple of sticks. Um, it's, going to be, it's going to be a process. I don't have a quick, you know, silver bullet for that, unfortunately. Right, well, on that note, I'm gonna to have to deliver the bad news that we're gonna to have to break for <laughs> coffee now, or good, however you see that. But thank you so much, Meda. Thank you. For that. Thank that you, everyone.